Hello, this is Yvonne Howell, and I am about to interview Slava Davis on his research project devoted to the international computer game called Stalker that was based on a Soviet science fiction novel. Hello, it's good to, good to be here with you and talk about our summer project that we worked on. Okay, great. So, first question. This research project required you to play hours and hours of Stalker, a computer game that has already released three series. I remember you joking, oh, I love the idea of getting credit for playing computer games all summer. Ha ha ha, but then you really had to play these <laughs> computer games all summer. So before we get into the project itself, I'd be interested to hear how you got into playing computer games to begin with. What is it that you love about spending time this way? For me, it's mostly social. I play, whenever I play video games, I play it with my friends. And I remember growing up and wanting to do it with my friends. Um, from a small town, we have, of course, school that you hang out with people and some after school activities like sports and whatnot. But really, uh, at night when you're younger and you can't drive and your parents say it's time to be home, if you want to hang out with your friends, you got to do it on uh, video games. So. We got an Xbox and I played a lot with my friends just online. And that's really what I like about games is the social aspect. I can't, it's hard for me to play for hours on end just by myself. It gets really boring and repetitive, but if I'm hanging out with friends and joking around and playing games together, it's really fun. And I can lose track of time a lot that easily. So I mostly play the social games. Uh, diff what the difference of Stalker is it's not a social game. You don't play it with other people. You play it all by yourself. And those are games that I don't really, uh, I don't lean towards those just because I can get bored pretty easily, even if it's an interesting story. Although Stalker did have an interesting story and I was forced to play three of these games uh, all summer, but it was fun and it took a lot of hours getting through it. I wasn't very good and it's a very hard game, um, but it was a lot of fun and I learned to appreciate more of the single player video games as opposed to just playing to play with friends. Okay, that's interesting. Um, what were some of the questions you had that led to, at first, really a successful summer research proposal? In other, in other words, what was the original point of doing this project? What did you hope to find out? I was really curious why an old Soviet novel became as, uh, the source of source material for three video games 30 years later with a new highly anticipated sequel on the way. Um, I wonder what was so special about uh, the Strugatsky's roadside picnic that someone would want to make it into a video game and how a book could be brought to a whole new audience by being a game. Uh, how people who play the game might be exposed to the book and the film in uh, ways that they wouldn't have before just by the fact that they were introduced through a video game. Uh, I've played these games before that are based on things, but uh, those are sort of linear adaptations of storylines. The adaptation of the Stalker games from Roadside Picnic is something totally different, and it takes a lot of base core story material and not so much plot. It, uh, and I just wanted to know why that leads people back around to the book and what makes the new one highly anticipated. It hasn't come out yet. It's been pushed back, uh, the release of it due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But it's still supposed to come out this December. So I really wanted to understand why people were excited for the new one based on even the sort of crummy, buggy issues that the older games had. What sort of charm is there in either the story or the gameplay and why people put in the time to build their own community around these this series of games and insight to how it provides um, the gateway to experience of a novel and a film. And I wanted to commit myself to a hard game and be able to say that, hey, one of these hard games is famous for sort of being difficult. I made it through and played all of them. I just realized, of course, this has this like sudden added added poignancy because mm -hmm. what, you, what you just said is that the novel, which was a great novel of the 1970s, nevertheless, it's not so much the plot of the novel that made it into the games, but that atmosphere of that weird zone where like mm -hmm. something has happened that is making the earth 
or that zone, that part, that little stretch of earth behave in weird ways with physics that don't seem earthly and so forth. But the atmosphere, right, goes into the yeah. game. And it's a Ukrainian company that yeah. made and designed the whole game in Ukraine. There's a Soviet novel and then Soviet film. And then decades later, the Ukrainian company took it up and decided to make three games about 15 years ago or so. And the new one's coming out 10 years, give or take, after the last one. So was, there was a sort of large gap between the film and the first Ukrainian games, and then a smaller but still substantial gap between the third game and the new one that's supposed to come out. So yeah. it's sort of an enduring sort of story, and for whatever reason. So I think what I want to ask you next is precisely about this atmosphere. Um, how did you, okay, so how did you, how did you proceed with this project? So you're mm -hmm. kind of doing roughly what we call an inter, intermedial kind of study of how there's a novel. Later, there was a very famous film that was also very different from the novel. Mm -hmm. Then there's the video games. And now as we speak, there's our unfortunate kind of knowledge of an atmosphere of, I guess, violence and um, tension, but also a lot of a lot of stuff going on in yeah. Ukraine right now. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to go there, but to walk us back to where you started doing the project and were kind of trying to a little bit theorize or talk about how a certain kind of atmosphere is evoked and conveyed to a player, even in a slightly buggy game. Yeah, so I started actually before the summer at the end of the semester when I had your Russian readings in Russian literature class. And I translated roughly 20 pages of Boris Drugatsky, who is one of the two authors of Red Second Pitnik. And I translated that and got to understand through his writing how difficult it was for them, for the brothers to get the original novel published in the Soviet Union and having to navigate all the Soviet censorship. And not only in terms of superficial censorship, but censorship and sort of underlying story and tone. And so I got to learn a lot about how the book was made. And then before I even started reading the book or watching the movie or playing the games, he pointed me towards uh, the intermedial, intermedial studies. And there are four terms that I learned that were pretty important when I did that. And those were transmediality, intertextual references, intermediality, and transcreation. And they're all very similar, but they relate to how stories can change through medium and uh, different ways that they can take and learn from one another. And I, it was helpful for me when I was learning about this to use the examples uh, that I could find and help me really solidify my understanding of these terms. Transmediality is changing medium. It's the same story, but changing between movies and TV shows and books and comics and all sorts of things. Um, the Star Wars universe is like that. There's a one canonical story that's told in all sorts of different mediums. So that's transmediality. Um, intertextual references are ways in which a piece of media follows the same structure or borrows a plot line. And that's more your standard parody films. So Spaceballs is this type of intertextual reference to Star Wars. It's the same medium film, but it sort of plays off of some aspects and some loose toying with the plot line. Um, intermediality is where aspects originating from one medium are adapted for use in another. Uh, you th can think of this in ways of video games, old video games in the 80s. You think of some of the earlier, most popular video games, Mario, and it's just sort of a 2D side-scrolling uh, video game. But as time and technology were able to increase, it allowed the video game to take on different shapes and different play styles. And so now you have all these modern video games with great graphics and they look like movies and you even have cinematic scenes. And so it borrows a lot of, it borrows a lot of how movies are shown and puts it into video games, which originally was a very different uh, sort of storytelling technique. And finally the, Transcreation is just translation of a creation, and you can think of that as translating through language or through cultures. I thought um, The Office is a transcreation 
from the British version of The Office to changing it to suit an American audience and play better here and you get the very popular TV show The Office. So I tried to look through, look in those ways as I read the novel and watched the movie and played the games and figure out how the story and the media change and influence each other. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And so then, so what were, I guess, some of your main findings? So then what did you come up with? It's hard to tell because not much is borrowed other than a bit of plot. So for me, it didn't fit nicely in any of these. I guess you could say it's a bit um, of the inner, it's not quite intertextual references because there are different mediums, but it's intertextual reference in the sense that they're referencing clearly uh, the big point, which is the zone, the big mysterious center piece of all three art pieces. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Um, as a player of the game, what does the zone feel like, or what does it mean? It represents, I think, mystery, and it's much denser in the center, and the outside is much more open, and it certainly gets more dangerous as you progress, just like any sort of video game would, but also the atmosphere changes from being a bit lighter and more carefree to serious and sort of dour and dark and depressing and quiet and intimidating. And so it's very much sort of like a black hole. It's fuzzier around the edges and it gets denser and denser as you approach the center. Um, so now I'm remembering, you also did a whole um, project or report on the um, HBO series on Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. I did that a couple years before this project. Right. So the zone kind of famously, the, the, the novel that kind of describes this zone uh, was created, was written about just 10 years before the Chernobyl accident. Mm -hmm. And when the Chernobyl accident happened, creating a zone around that, that nuclear disaster, where in fact, it becomes very dangerous for people to be yeah. and the environment now has kind of properties that are not normal but you know geiger counters are buzzing off like crazy and mm -hmm. things are born mutated and and oddly apple orchards and harvests seem to be better than ever some weird effect of radiation <laughs> right so people were you know very struck about how this was an instance where life seemed to have imitated art although in a very unfortunate way because mm -hmm. you have a novel that depicts a zone that apparently has come into being because aliens touched down there for an evening but then we had the chernobyl accident so then when you're playing these games and you're going into the zone that becomes more and more dangerous as you get towards the center. Did it remind you of also the whole the Chernobyl story and the depiction of Chernobyl that you saw in that 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 yeah, series? Yeah, it did. And it's it, the, at the heart of the zone in the games is the Chernobyl reactor. The, ah. the, it, that's the key point of the plot line of the games. So in the storyline of in the novel, the zone was created because aliens came and sort of threw trash around and left and <laughs> left all sorts of weird gadgets in certain places on earth and so those are dangerous zones filled with alien technology but in the video games it uh chernobyl happened just like it happened in real life and the soviet government realized that after they created the exclusion zone and sent people away from the area that there was a new private sort of area where nobody could come in and investigate whatever sort of weird science they were doing and so they sent some scientists in to study what was called the Nuosphere, which is a real, it's a philosophical concept uh, of human consciousness and sort of collected mental energy that surrounds the globe. And in the game, they were studying this and they created psychological psychic weapons to manipulate people. And a bunch of scientists actually fused their minds together and created what in the game is called the sea consciousness and so it's this uh psychic sort of communion of 10 or so scientists so like in the psi heart of consciousness like ps c uh like 
collective consciousness. Oh, oh, oh consciousness. okay. Uh-huh. And uh, so they created this psychic sort of deity almost of their collective minds. And then when the Soviet Union fell in the story, um, the sea consciousness tried to expand throughout the newosphere around the world and manipulate people's minds to create world peace. And it failed and it sort of blew up in their face and created a really dangerous zone with all these anomalies and things around, directly around and surrounding the Chernobyl reactor that in part is due to all the radiation that was still there and is part due to the meddling in the psychic world that these scientists did. And that creates all sorts of mutants and monsters and to protect itself, the sea consciousness created sort of a mythos and made it had a psychic field around itself to make it hard to penetrate regular people into the zone and figure out what was going on. It's, Looking it's pretty, back on it, do you have any inkling strange. that the sea consciousness or the scientists that are creating the sea consciousness are somehow Russian as opposed to Ukrainian? I'm not sure I'd say they're Russian. I think it all. I think it signaled that they're um, Soviet scientists. So that could be Russian, Ukrainian, any yeah. scientists from all over the Soviet Union. But it seemed like a uniquely um, Soviet experiment as opposed yes. to just a Russian experiment or Ukrainian experiment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I did want to ask you also about the, the movie, the famous Tarkovsky movie, mm -hmm. um, also bearing the title, title Stalker. So in the novel, as we know, the kind of brave guys that, 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 that risk their lives going into the zone to kind of poach weird booty, you know, this mm -hmm. leftover alien trash that has these completely incomprehensible incomprehensible physical properties those guys are called stalkers that's yeah. kind of their uh vocation um and the, the title of the novel itself roadside picnic is this kind of almost lighthearted and funny kind of reference to the fact that the, the best theory anyone can come up with about the creation of the zone is that some aliens basically just stopped on earth for a few hours had the equivalent of a picnic left the equivalent of their crazy alien trash and and we wake up the next morning in the 30 mile zone or around where the aliens have their picnic just is completely altered to mm -hmm. us, right? But then the movie Stalker, Tarkovsky's movie, famously also dispenses with almost the entire plot. Yeah. Dispenses with basically everything other than three hours of very interesting filmmaking, right? That's very kind of addic addictively atmospheric even though famously like in a certain sense nothing ever happens yeah. how did you experience the movie as i think you said is mostly atmosphere a lot of great imagery came from it and filmmaking and camera uh, great use of the camera to show what was going on to be honest i know this is supposed to be one of the great films that you be on your hundred have to watch film list I didn't love it that much. I'm glad I watched it. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't as adventurous as the novel. The novel had more sense of danger and urgency and intrigue. And the movie, while aesthetically very pleasing, wasn't, it didn't satisfy even my desire to see a dangerous zone. In the movie, it's basically, um, three guys standing around in an overgrown field and some decrepit buildings and they're like it's the mysterious zone and the in the novel they tell you about all the hard dangers and how you can almost barely move for fear of hitting a secret trap and dying in some horrific way uh, but in the film they are sort of walking around and they're tossing their bolts to set off any sort of invisible traps and none none really happens and so it just, for me, it was missing the strict sense of danger from the zone that the novel had. And eventually the games would bring back. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, watching the movie is certainly almost maybe the opposite experience of 
I was about to say the opposite experience of playing a game where I'm imagining there's a lot of this shooting and action going on. But on the other hand, maybe the one thing the movie and the game, as you've told me more about it, both have in common, it's like not that easy. You told me repeatedly that this game, like you had to really concentrate. It was hard mm -hmm. to get good at it. Or it is very hard. Get not... where you need to go. I wonder if you could tell us non video game players a little bit more about kind of how that difficulty works, what kind of, how you're like improving your skills or what you have to mm -hmm. do. It was hard. I'm not very good at video games to begin with. I'd say I'm about average, not great, not terrible. And it was hard. There's a lot of enemies that are really good as you're shooting your way through the zone. Uh, a lot of other dangers, a lot of mutant monsters, sort of creepy dangers that come at you. A lot of just random traps that'll pop up. And so at certain points you do have to use your little nuts and bolts that you have in your backpack to throw around and set off the trap so you can avoid the giant uh, fire. And... But so what are, is this a matter of hand dexterity or like strategy or like what part of your brain is activating when you're playing these games? I'd say it's a lot of, in terms of fighting monsters and whatever, it's a lot of traditional uh, game strategy where you use your, you have to be fairly coordinated with your hands and be able to shoot with the mouse and aim right and not miss. And But you also have to have a heightened sense of awareness. Like a lot of games I've played, you do just sort of run around and shoot and it's no big deal you don't have to think you can turn your brain off and just run around and shoot anybody that comes at you but you have to be more careful and adapt to different situations a bit more and so it's hard because it's just hard the enemies are really tough and really strong and can easily kill you and you're some weak little man running around in the zone with <laughs> like a sweatpants on and trying to survive a mutant monster attack so it's also just the sheer health of the enemies and lack of your own sort of game health and how much damage you have to do and how little damage you have to take in a fight to win it. And eventually that is rewarding because you've worked your way up and gotten better and practiced and it does feel very rewarding to have gotten to a point at some at, towards the end of the game where you've gotten all the good gear you've gotten the good weapons and it's not as hard and so it feels good to make that transition from wow this is really hard i was dying often very every couple every minute or so i would die i'd have to restart uh, <laughs> so it, it, that, that also adds to the stress of it and how or the terror of the game because it's not strictly speaking a horror terror game but it does create in you the sense of oh if i die i'm gonna have to start all over start way back and lose all my progress so there is that it gives you that fear of your little character that he may die even though you know you'll be fine but there are points where the music and the ambiance and you know there's a monster around here somewhere but you can't see it or hear it and it could jump out at you and <laughs> set you back. Stressful. Okay, but still, that's interesting. So in a certain sense, uh, the game also, you're in the position of the underdog who, can event, who, if you're skillful and determined, can almost unexpectedly win out over a much larger and better armed foe. You can certainly win any fight in the beginning if you're just good enough. If you've if you're good enough at games, you can have the perfect aim and movement to hide from whatever danger is and pop out at the right moment. Or if you've played it a lot, I've seen videos of people. Uh, when I started, I watched a lot of reviews of this game, and some guy had even uploaded full playthroughs of the entire game that he did it. He played through one of the whole games in six hours or something, and it took me way longer than that because I was dying over and over, and this was just hundredth time or whatever <laughs> playing the game but you you watching him and he's doing great at it and just talking oh this is so easy or whatever but it's um it's a lot if you're just good at it then uh -huh. it's one of those things if you're good at it then you're good at it and practice helps 
but so does natural skill. Okay. That, all right. That was very interesting. Um, I think I wanted to ask you, yeah, um, I'm sure the war has now delayed this, but the company is coming out. I mean, there's, like you said, a very anticipated sequel after all these years to, to the stalker. So um, people have been, there's been re online reviews already of the new game that was supposed to be released this year, right? It's still supposed to come out just, it was supposed to come out in a few days as it was supposed to come out in uh, mid-April. Um, I think the last I looked at it is supposed to come out end of December now. Okay, wow. I'm just like, you're going to have to do a whole other project because I think the reception of this coming out of Ukraine right now is going to be really different. You're going to be able to read all kinds of other allegorical things into mm -hmm. this game. But at the time, the review that I read said this new game has the potential to break the boundaries um, of the endearingly archaic trilogy that you played. Um, and it just... This reviewer suggested the he hopes the game makers do five key things to um, really make the the new gamified version of the Strugatsky's novel kind of a super success. And I was wondering what your take was on these suggestions. His first suggestion was um, level of difficulty that Stalker Two, so the new game, part of Chernobyl, should adjust its level of difficulty to give the, the, its players the existential sense of the threat at the heart of the zone. Um, does that make sense? He felt like the new game really needs to somehow highlight that existential threat? I think it sort of depends on what you mean and how you want the game to develop its existential sense of the zone's threat and I think the games that have already been made look obviously to the novel and to the movie and so I think the new game should probably not just look at the old games but should also focus and take inspiration hopefully from the novel and the movie and I think in the novel what's scary about the zone is not just the dangers inside of it but how it can affect the life outside of the zone. Uh, the main character, Red, his daughter, who he calls Monkey, isn't fully human. Uh, she's fully mutated because Red has spent so much time in the zone getting uh, a not so healthy dose of whatever alien energy or radiation is there. And the zone here in the novel also has a mental effect. He, Red isn't supposed to be a, a stalker. It's uh, sort of a dangerous profession, not just because you could die, but also because it's pretty it's illegal. illegal yeah. mm -hmm. And he's always facing the threat of arrest or ruin outside the zone from society and from the physical toll the zone's taken on his body, even outside. Mm -hmm. And so there's always the threat of death. Inside the zone, it's a more physical death, but outside it's more psychological, societal, in terms of if you have a kid that's half monkey because you've spent so much time in the zone and that does a number on your sort of psyche and perception of what you're doing with your life. Um, in the film, I got the sense of more danger from the military outside the zone. It seemed that Tarkovsky was trying for me, he painted the zone as a bit more peaceful than outside because as they're trying to get into the zone, they have to sort of bust past the military guard that's standing outside preventing them from getting in. But once they're in, like I said, it's not as obviously dangerous as it is in the novel or the games. And it is three guys standing in a field and it's a nice pretty field and the color palette changes and it looks different and dangerous but serene in its sort of danger. Um, it's definitely a bit creepy, but the first shot is just nature. There's not not any of the specific dangers from the novel, like the hell slime, or there's certainly no mutants in the film. It the no, terror. Yeah, the dangers in the film seem to ultimately be all the ones that we carry within us, just mm -hmm. by being human beings. I think it's a lot of our own, our own psyche. Yeah, a lot of the sort of unease that you feel from watching it is 
what the characters are going to do to one another and how they could betray each other or leave one behind in the mysterious zone and not you're not as worried about something jumping out from a wall and getting you so i think it's not as immediately dangerous uh, certainly as the novel um i feel like in the game when you're in control and also have no experience that it gives you sort of a sense of both the fear of the zone in the games comes from of course the scary looking monsters that sort of jump at you and make you restart and lose all your progress uh but a lot of it is just the threat that maybe you'll turn the corner and be murdered or maybe everything will be all right and so it's sort of edge of your seat type of gameplay where you have to always be cognizant and aware of what's going on around you and you have to like I said, you, it starts and you're really bad and die a lot, and then as you get better, you gain the experience that Red has in the novel, and that's what makes him such an effective stalker in the novel, is he has the experience of being in it, and that's what makes the game fun and interesting towards the end, when you have all the experience and can navigate to dangers much more confidently than you can in the beginning. And so I think, for the new one, all that is to say, for the new one, they should probably, the difficulty level, I didn't think needs much reworking it's good to feel that sense of terror and dread and sort of inability in the beginning but an important component also i think is the experience that you feel at the end of upgrading and becoming a real stalker and not just some intruder to the zone you feel it feels a bit more like you um belong in that it's not as foreign to you. You spent more time there as you get there, and so that the scale of difficulty. Obviously, even as you go into the game, the dangers become more dangerous. You're just better equipped to handle them. Mm-hmm. So, in a way, it is. It does get harder as you go along. It just feels easier, even though it's not, because experience is uh, really powerful. I think in in the novel and in the games. Mm-hmm. The next thing the reviewer suggested, and this one I found quite interesting, is that they hoped that the new game, the new version, would actually have more local color. Um, You've studied Russian, um, you're a Russian (laughs) studies major. How do you think the games could add a distinct feeling of place and culture to the supposedly East European Soviet setting? I mean, it takes place now in Ukraine around the Chernobyl zone. Did, did the games in it evoke any of that enough? Um, I thought it had a well enough, well off sense of culture. It's not, the point of the game isn't so much the culture as the culture informs the game in the sense that it does take place yes. around Chernobyl. And so it's not, it, if Chernobyl had happened in Australia, I guess you'd have mutant kangaroos running around. It's just, it informs it, and I thought it was good. And I do remember that article, uh, the author made the point that less English would be more immersive because the characters are speaking in English, and some of the translations into English are a bit wonky. Uh-huh. So that's, I guess, immersive insofar as you can tell that whoever wrote the original dialogue didn't write it in English. But I think it, I think that uh, is interesting and a great aspect to the game. Um, it's really just a sci-fi world it's the culture is meant to be late soviet era but it's also grimy and dirty criminals who aren't related to any sort of government they're just going around doing their own thing killing each other stealing things and uh i'm not sure you can add much uh, specific culture without reducing it to just stereotype one of the funniest stereotypes that i still love is whenever you get dosed with radiation and need a counter to it if you just drink enough vodka in the game then it uh, it, it makes the radiation go away so oh, okay. I, don't, I don't know how much you can get into throwing yeah. in more stereotypes of uh-huh. sort of russian soviet culture without just being oh you're wearing a tracksuit now and yeah have an ak and all yeah, you do is drink vodka. vodka um the other the reviewer's other suggestion was improved gunplay this this i must admit is kind of lost on me um but what do you think i think it could definitely stand to be improved um even the most accurate guns in the game comparatively were still very inaccurate i remember i was playing 
which is what a technological glitch is that i don't it, I, it seemed to me to be purposeful uh -huh. you could have your crosshairs line up on a target and shoot five different times and you hit five different things even though your sights haven't changed uh -huh. and so that seems to be uh purposeful and i guess i get what they're going for to make it less predictable and a bit more dangerous and add a shred of luck to it on the other hand it's also just really annoying it would be nice if there if some uh of the later guns or even mid level guns were more accurate in the sense that it's you shoot what you're actually aiming at one of my friends was watching me play he's saying dude why can't you hit anything you terrible at this game and i was like all right hold on and i sat him down to look and i had the crosshairs on aiming at something far away and i shot three times and missed all three shots even though i was aiming at a still target and not moving it's just because the bullets fly uh wildly off target and that after certainly the game's long enough that after a while that gets sort of that's stops being immersive and just becomes annoying and a pain to deal with so i think in that sense it could be uh it could certainly be improved um in other ways i think it was uh, a lot of ways i think it was fine i liked the uh limited ammunition that you had and all sorts of difficulties that you could have with the guns and i thought the mechanic where if you use a gun long enough, it sort of degrades and yeah. jams more frequently. I thought that uh, was very interesting. Just the core aspect of having your bullet go where you're actually pointing the gun. It would be <laughs> nice if that actually happened more often than not. Um, suggestion number four was use more of the original novel. One critic says so much of the cool stuff in the novel, which was, you know, that's true. The sentient slime, the eternal batteries, the batteries that never run out of energy, the full empties, famously, if you mm -hmm. read the novel, you know what those are, the walking dead and the supernatural children. Um, those never made it into the, the original stalker games. Um, is there anything you would bring back in from the novel and why? I think the full empties are sort of classic from the novel. And a lot of things could just be added cosmetically where you don't they don't have to work out operating with it or dealing with it. Just have it in the background. I think it'd be cool to walk into an underground lab and see a pile of full empties. Yeah. And to be honest, there could have been that in somewhere in the game. I just might have missed it. But there's not the sense of visual um, activity in the games as you get from reading the novel. In the novel, you feel like there's stuff everywhere. And in the games, a lot of the um, world is empty of the physical um, non-sentient dangers it's got plenty of monsters and the book didn't have crazy monsters that attack you and uh, various weird strange psychic ways um, but a lot of the physical sort of visual aspects could be brought into the game and improved it if only aesthetically and um, atmospherically yeah that makes sense and I guess, let me see, finally, the reviewers hope that the new version would just have stronger characters. Um, what characters would you like to see included or defined in a more interesting way? I liked Strelok. He was the um, guy that you're hunting in the first one mm -hmm. and makes other appearance and prequel versions of the game and don't want to get too much into spoiling the plot for <laughs> anyone who would want to um, play the games but it was he was a very intriguing character you spend the whole first game learning about him and his past and it'd be cool to sort of be more immersed in that character as opposed to um, characters viewing him from the outside he was sort of the main mysterious bad guy that you're chasing and so i think it'd be cool to have a deeper atmosphere around characters and just probe the ones that they already have a bit more so deeply more backstory or more yeah i don't uh -huh. think i don't think they need to add more or mm. make it more complicated just go deeper into what you already have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
Okay, let's see. Oh, well, this last question, which I wrote, I think during our initial、um, work together last summer, when you were when we were、um, meeting repeatedly about your progress, I said, let's say you, Slava, got an internship at GSC, so the game game world、uh, based in U- in Ukraine. Um, after they found out that you did this research project, and they're going to ask you to help them on the new project, what would you want to learn, find out, know more about from the heart of Chernobyl game team? Now, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be going to、yeah. Ukraine anytime soon. But、um, I, I did wonder after you've, you've done so much playing and so much work with this this game, if you could imagine yourself somehow in the role of creating computer games. You know.、Mm-hmm. I was、um, because this is a single-player game for me. It a lot of it has to do with story, and a lot of people play this game because it's hard, and they even modify the game and have a misery setting where it's just impossible to play. And people like a lot of it because it it is hard and punishing. But for me, who plays video games mostly socially, it's、uh, the story is really important and. I would be curious why they kept pushing, because this game's been delayed for several years. Why they've been fighting to, what story could be so compelling that they want to go through all this trouble to publish a game, and still, even after they're being invaded、uh, by Russia, they've just they've pushed off the date again, but they haven't canceled the game yet. So it seems,、uh, it seems that something about it is really、uh, driving them. To push forward all the trouble that they have had with creating it, and now with trying to find a release date when they're not being invaded,、uh, what story is that interesting? That what? How does it? T- how could it tie into the novel and the movie and the other games? And what's so compelling about it that they just have to tell it in、uh, the new game? And playing it will reveal that. But I would ask them. What about the story? You can see the story by playing the game, but what about it spoke to the head of GSC Game World to want to push it through so much? Because that's I think that's really interesting that they're they still haven't given up and still want to get it out there for people to play and enjoy. But it's kept very much under wraps. I take it like you don't get leaks about what's gonna what's gonna go on. I think there. I haven't looked into it much. I think there's probably. A little bit known about it, but the whole plot line is not going to be、mm-hmm. not going to be told before the game's out. Okay, I think that wraps up my questions. I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add. No, I don't think so. I think that's about it. Just talking about how it all fits together is really interesting, and I look forward to printing out the poster and having the exhibit at the. Symposium and hopefully getting one of the computers for people to come by and play the game. Okay, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you.